Good afternoon and welcome to the provocatively titled Is Telly a Turnoff for Young and New Talent? Uh, we've got a terrific panel and I know that everyone always says that and quite often it isn't true. Uh, but this one genuinely is great. Uh, we've got the controller of BBC Three, Fiona Campbell, uh, chicken shop date legend and cult presenter Amelia de Moldenberg, the head of development for Talent Works at BBC Studios, Helen O'Donnell and I think I can say this, my favourite from People Just Do Nothing, Asim Chowdhury. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's, I think we'll just get the question answered quite quickly. Um, is telly a turn off for new talent? <laughs> it's just yes or no down the line. Fiona? No. Amelia? No, if they commission. No, uh, uh, <laughs> no, no. 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 Yes, but commissioners listen. Ah. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, that's, so that's that, really. I don't know if you want to. Um, We've got 50 minutes. Uh, Can we leave as well? <laughs> I think, I mean, if everyone's happy to, it's sort of quite definitive, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, I think we, we should, Phil. We'll have a chat. We'll have a chat. Because um, whether you look at it just sort of anecdotally or, or if you look at the stats, it is clear that the way that audiences are consuming content is changing very rapidly. So half of UK households uh, now have video on demand subscriptions. Uh, UK adults, on average, uh, watch half an hour of YouTube a day. Uh, and it's also clear that the path to becoming on screen talent is changing quite a lot. So when I was starting, which admittedly was quite a long time ago, mm. uh, you could maybe film something if your mate's dad had a camcorder, but there's nowhere to put it and it was sort of pointless. Um, equally, it feels like there were more routes in. Uh, so for me, it was sort of E4 and, and, and T4 and before that, maybe like the Big Breakfast and regional programmes. Um, Whereas now, uh, maybe less obvious routes in, but anyone with a phone can upload content and see if it finds an audience. Um, so starting with you, if I can, Fiona, which I can, um, how, do you, uh, how do you work to, because I'm running it and I do what I like, uh, how do you work to identify and nurture new talent these days? There's a lot out there. There's a lot out there. Um, I would say at BBC Three, we have two bases. There's the London team and the Birmingham team, and there's probably about eight to 10 of us are constantly looking at development, thinking of ideas, thinking of the next areas of relevance that we talk about that we want to get into. And our in-house development team on that side are constantly coming to me with talent that they've found you know, on YouTube, on Instagram, that they like, or in fact, that they know um, personally. So that we've got people coming through all the time that way. Uh, Hot Property, we've just done Young Philly's very established on YouTube, and he's going to go into series two of that now on uh -huh. BBC Three. Um, and then on top of that, you know, people because people have the ability to make their own content and demonstrate their own voice and demonstrate um, just their own abilities, either visually or in terms of say comedic talent. People send us stuff. Um, I get sent stuff directly or the, the team gets sent stuff and then on top of that indies come along having fine people so there's there's, there's many ways um, and I would say because of, of social and third party platforms it, there's just many more entry points that people can say look I have an audience I can bring uh -huh. an audience people want to engage in a positive way with what I do and then that gets our attention. Uh, Amelia do you, can you feel the the hungry gaze of TV execs on your every move. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's a bit intense. Um, no, ki kind of, I guess. I mean, I was have been brought into meetings with different controllers and different channels, like for over the past maybe like three years now, from when I started doing Chicken Shop Date. And I feel like there's a big appetite for channels and controllers and broadcasters to bring digital talent, whether that's just from Instagram or from YouTube, onto the platform. Um, in a whole variety of ways, whether that actually ends up happening is is another thing, really. Mm. Uh, there's a great example, obviously, of a, of a very successful transition from online to telly. Uh, let's have a, a look at a clip from an early webisode <laughs> of People Just Do Nothing. This is from 2009, I think, and it's absolute gold. <laughs> so... Hear your voice off camera there, so some stuff changed. Uh, but talk us through how you and Corrupt FM went from that to winning a BAFTA, but ideally do it in about 40 seconds. Right. <laughs> um, well, basically, we, um, I finished, I did a film and broadcast degree. So I had my camera, I was doing little shit music videos in car parks. 
And um, right, yeah, we just, it, it was based on an original documentary called Tower Block Dreams, which was also on BBC Three. And we were just obsessed with it. And also we used to like all rap and MC and we kind of grew up around that same area. So we just mimicked these characters and we just started uploading it to YouTube. And then um, I think we had a very slow, it's not like, like Amelia, she, it's got a quite good, you know, she uploads content quite a lot. I think we did three webisodes in around four, three and a half years. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was a real slow burner. Yeah. We had jobs and shit. <laughs> and we were just messing around, we didn't know. But then one of the, um, John Petrie from Rough Cut Productions, Ashatala's company, um, you know, he messaged me on YouTube and we used to get a lot of hate comments because people thought it was real, as you can see, it looks terrible. You made it look even worse. I remember, <laughs> it being, I remember it being looking better than that. But people thought we were real and they used to go, you job seeking scum and you know, get, you know, get a life and all that. So I used to get a lot of hate through the YouTube. And then John Petrie messaged me saying, I work for Ashatala, he produced The Office coming for a chat and I was going to be like, fuck off, mate. Yeah. But <laughs> he was like, no, I'm for real, come in. And we went for a chat and then, yeah. yeah. It's then, a great slider doors moment there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck off, John. Yeah. Yeah. Done, you're not here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so from, from effectively, obviously, owning the whole creative process and your own timeline, doing it in your own time, um, to it being broadcast on, on the BBC, how much control did you have to give up, do you think? I think, you know, I think it was not really as much of control because we did five webisodes we also did other content and we were already gigging in character. So the world mm. was quite developed already. Um, basically, it was, they made it better, really. They helped us write. They helped us understand, you know, sick, um, scripting. And, you know, and, and also a lot of the old stuff on YouTube, it's not really available anymore because a lot of it was quite fucked up. It was like, you know, really sexist. <laughs> it was like, but because we were really imitating how these people were in real life. So, you know, they would say sexist comments, they would say homophobic comments, but obviously that's the character, but you can't, that doesn't really fly on a BBC sitcom. Mm -hmm. And also they just helped us kind of broaden it out to a bigger audience. Cause I think, you know, the YouTube stuff, it was like 98% male orientated, you know? So then it kind of opened it up with characters like Mish and they helped us develop it. And I think it was all good. And uh, cause there was so much there. And also we're all the four, you know, the four of us, the, the creators, we're all such strong minded individuals. I think if they wanted to change it more, we would have been like, well, no, actually, we don't want to do it. So they were aware of it. I think it helped us, basically. Without yeah. a platform like, like YouTube, is there any chance you think you could have got people just do nothing off the ground? I, I mean, I don't think so. And this was 2009, so it wasn't really, you know, there, were, there wasn't that many viral things going on. YouTube was just seen as a thing that, you know, you're just watching your spare time and it wasn't seen as this platform. So no, I, don't, I think without YouTube, you know, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, I don't know, can you, you can put videos on MySpace, but... That's not as really, wasn't as, it wasn't really a video, it was more of a Not going to catch fire, is nah, it really? No, nah. <laughs> um, and, and how much, how many cues were you taking from stuff that you were watching on telly? Because um, you kind of watch it and you feel The Office, you know, that kind of like mockumentary style. Were you fans of The Office and then thought we can do something like that for this world that we know? Yeah, no, definitely. We were like huge fans of The Office. It was like The Office, Partridge, Peep Show, um, in between us, brass eye, like we all watched that religiously and we used to quote it to each other. But also the real inspiration came from the real people that we grew mm. up around. Like we knew all these characters, we were mates with them. You know, like Chabadi G is like every dodgy geezer you know around the area. Yeah. You know, Grinders, every MC person who thinks he's amazing. Steve's is your fucking local pillhead. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> these characters are real characters. So even though, you know, technically we would use techniques used in comedy and we understood, you know, you know, about pacing and awkward moments and beats and all that kind of stuff. But we had to bring our own world into it, our own West London kind of, or, you know, sincerity to, like, to the show. When you started doing Chicken Shop Day, Amelia, were you taking any, any cues from stuff that you watched on, on telly? Mm. I guess um, Pop World was a big mm, inspiration yeah. for me, like Simon Amstel, Makita Oliver, the way that they were able to... Um, were you on that? No, I just did a bit where I was like, here's Pop World. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. and that was my... Listen, I make it sound easy, <laughs> but seriously. <laughs> that was my favourite bit. Times. Yeah, that yeah. was my favourite bit. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, big, big inspiration for me too. Um, yeah, like the way that they interacted with celebrities, with musicians, and it was, mm. it was such a like um, fun environment and poked fun at these people that are in some kind of position of power and were asking questions that I think you always wanted to know the answer to, but the straight edged sort of music interviews or just interview formats in general weren't really doing that at the time when I started Chicken Shop Day. 
So I started Chicken Shop Date because there were because I was bored of the regular music interview formats that I'd seen, and I sort of wanted to do something that um, with a, like comedy first. Um, so yeah, I guess Pop World was a big inspiration, and then um, I guess Between Two Ferns, the yeah. that yeah. Kalifanakis and um, comedians in cars getting coffee, the Jerry Seinfeld show, kind of. Um, but yeah, they were like the biggest inspirations to me, I guess. Uh, and when you look at sort of creativity generally, do you think there is more out there online than than, than anywhere else, Helen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's the this we've stopped having a barrier to entry. So you can, if you've got a creative voice, you can find a vehicle for that voice. Whether it's a short Instagram story that will take you next to no time to record and upload, or a fully scripted YouTube show that you spend a lot of time producing. I think that's what's really exciting. If you've got a creative voice, you can get it online to an audience very quickly without a whole load of gatekeepers mm. asking permission to them. You can just go and do it. Yeah, what, what we find increasingly, which is interesting, is even people were casting into formatted shows, it will emerge in strange ways that they have their own hidden YouTube channels. And so you don't even, but then that's not related to what they're actually going to do with us. But you just sort of realize that lots and lots of people are running their own content vehicles. Mm. It's like they're dragons. Not, they're not trying to be, you know, presenters. This is not what they're trying to be. It's just how they have fun. You know, it's like in Dragons Den when they pitch yeah. one business. Yes. And then that's they go, it, what about your other business? Oh, that's not, that's not available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, no, we want it. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> it. That was actually pitching. doing well yeah. already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't need yeah. you for that. Well, yeah. I'm getting more of these emails that says, you remember the, the guy that we thought was really good? Well, it's just emerged that he's also, and you're like, wow, all these mm. people have got these different channels going on. It's interesting. But yeah, Chicken and Shop Date happened because I originally pitched it to um, uh, online platforms and broadcasters and everyone, nobody wanted it. So then I was like, well, I'm going to steer myself. And um, <laughs> and so that's how it happened, really. It's because of, like, the gatekeeping is, I think, such a barrier for so many young people, mm. especially and what YouTube has allowed. And YouTube and now, obviously, Instagram, too, and other social media platforms is, like, yeah, as Helen was saying, for you to be in control of, the, of your content. Well, there's people, like, there's um, some first-time presenters that we are going to be working with that felt a bit mean <clears throat> later on the year <laughs> first time yeah. I mean whatever when who's anybody's first time but um and you know when they have an Instagram channel or exactly they've got a set of stories going out you can see that they've got you know it's a place where I can see what they've got to say and how they say it and also how people react to what they say and it's kind of like a mini pilot a mini taster to their what they want to say in an hour on BBC three and that has, for the, those people that have come to my attention that way, it's, it's really useful because it's just them. They haven't got any agent, they haven't got anything. They're I think that's what's it. really exciting because yeah. then you do everything. So you write it, you edit it, you direct it. You're also doing yeah. your own marketing plan for it. You might be creating your own digital assets yeah. and your own design. That's to be mm. celebrated yeah. and applauded. Yeah. Yeah, being it's an all-rounder and all of those things is so valuable to be able to like both me and Asim like we can we produce our a lot of our own content I do anyway and Asim does and so being able to know each but both sides of like of, of the industry I think makes you a better performer it makes you a better producer. It's a yeah. kind of interesting thing talking about the the gatekeeping because you look at you know some stuff is is fully formed like Shiro's story for example which is amazing. And, and has now gone on to do, do incredibly well. But you sort of know that that would not have been picked up by a broadcaster. Like you, you, you just do, don't you? And, and that's maybe something that we, we need to look at, isn't it? Do you think, Ella? Or, or is it great that it exists on YouTube? It, you know, it is telly the big ambition. Sometimes it's yep. okay to not be on TV. Maybe it reaches a bigger audience on YouTube or you can have comments on YouTube and yeah. you have full creative control. So really, they, they can do it without the TV industry. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking from the perspective of TV people. Yeah. It's a shame for them. Yeah, well <laughs> not, then, It's not a shame for, you know, for Ratman, no. He's making a movie now. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah, 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 yeah. Doing amazingly well. Um, for, just for anyone who hasn't seen uh, Amelia doing Chicken Shop Date, and it's had 26 million streams and counting, so you probably have, uh, let's have a quick look at a highlights reel. How, how important uh, to, to you guys, uh, Amelia and, and uh, Asim, is the sort of two-way communication that you can have with your 
your audience, the direct line that you have, um, how much does that shape your work? Um, yeah, I think a lot. I think um, for personally, for my Chabadi G socials, I, um, I, a lot of the time I test out jokes. So if it's something funny comes to me or if it's like a cultural kind of thing that happens you know, in pop culture or just generally anything, I'll put it on my Instagram, put it on my Twitter, my Facebook, and then you, I can instantly see the reaction if something goes viral. A lot of that stuff makes it into the show. You know, like sayings like, you know, girthy, um, you know, just, I mean, I can't even think, but there was, there's so many, um, so, so much stuff that we kind of think, well, that's, that was quite popular, you know, and then we put that into the script. And then when it comes on the show, people already know that joke. So it's quite, it's quite a cool thing. And obviously top comments are really useful as yeah. well. You go to a YouTube video, you go to your Instagram, the top comment is normally like a brilliant bit of writing that everyone agrees, you know, that's the best. And you go to it and it's, it's great. Some of the stuff you think, oh, fuck, it's better than my caption. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I, I think it's great to test stuff out. Um, I, I've even tested out a few new characters that I'm kind of, that's in development. And I've actually created Instagrams for them. And I haven't really, you know, promoted it much, but created it as if they're like real characters. And they've just got, a, like, you know, they just get a following. And you start thinking, okay. And then what I'm doing is I'm actually developing a character in real time on social media, which is, you know, like, you know, obviously I did that with, you know, with your buddy G, he kind of existed before that as well. But now that I'm so super aware of what people catch on to, what they like, I'm actually forming these characters. Then I, I understand the character so much because they're real, they interact with people. So when it does come to scripting and, you know, you know you're plotting out a narrative or something, I know how that character is going to react in certain situations because I've kind of tested it out, you know? So I think, I think it's great. And also for kind of, my agent, Debbie Allen, she kind of always told me that when you are doing, you know, character stuff, because I like doing character stuff, I don't really like doing too much stuff as myself, I like the mask to hide. Um, you know, if you've got a new character, it's always good to have proof that it pre-existed yeah. before the broadcaster gets, you know, their hands on it, because then there's an argument of who actually created this, and then it can get messy, and <laughs> trust me. <laughs> so it's good to have proof that it pre-existed and yeah, all and this kind agent. of stuff. Yeah. And a really good agent. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it's kind of like, you know, when you come to the character rights, because, you know, like I use Sasha Baron Cohen as an example. He, he, his Ali G and Borat character was on the Channel 4 show. And then I don't know the exact story, but I know that he ended up buying his character rights. So he owned that character. And then obviously he went on and did whatever he wanted to. So in a way, it, it can liberate you. It can give you freedom. Yeah. And it doesn't just lock you down to one show, one format. The, you, know, you know, formats die. Characters can live on forever. Um, if you do it right, I mean, if you look at Coogan and, you know, Gervais, all these people, these mm -hmm. characters are still very relevant. So I think it's really useful. The comment section for me, in, like, especially, is like somewhere where I can like literally d directly contact my audience and you build a community through the comments, through the like the funny ones, the not so funny ones. And people like suggest like artists they want to have on the show. I listen to some of them, some of them I don't. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I guess also being in, for, as a YouTuber, being in control of your analytics, I think mm. is like so powerful because I don't know exactly how it works with TV, but I'm not sure that like produ production companies get like all of the analytics from the shows that they create for broadcast. And like for me, I can see where people have watched it, the age of people, um, like all, these, all of these different factors, which then I guess makes you understand your program way more and also gives you ideas of what to do in the future, whether that's with the same format or if you're creating a new format, you can sort of figure out from like the type of people that are watching it, what they like. And also there's a, a tab on um, YouTube, the community tab, where you can literally just ask your subscribers questions. So like the other day I was like, what do you want to see from me on this channel? And they literally just tell you what they want. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I, I think on, on TV, there's uh, the 34 people across the country have a bar box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you just, That's you, how just it works, yeah. you just multiply up from that and it gives you a rough idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. And if it turns out that you've got good figures, you, you'd say it's gospel. And if it turns out you've got bad figures, you're like, there's so few of them, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, so, well, to, so, be, to speak for the TV people, even though I don't run a TV channel, um, I think now for the, the on demand, like for OD and definitely for iPlayer, there is a world of information and analytics yeah. about like watch times, what kind of people are watching that we on BBC Three are very focused in on, mainly because we have to be, because we're not a channel, we're a real in iPlayer, but I totally um, subscribe to that for you. Some of that, sh the short form that, that we make that comes um, from the Birmingham team, we look at that to say who, which, you know, these are 
ordinary punters and we look and see who really worked there that we can maybe do something longer with, which editorial piece worked really well with there that we could build out into a long form. So it's exactly that sort of very granular um, audience hits and, and comments, the kind of thing people are saying to you that um, is really of, of value. It's quicker, it's just quicker. Yeah. Mm. Um, having you've sort of done stuff on on both sides now, Mia, because you've done mm. you know you've done stuff for Channel Four and ITV and Vice. Um, how different is it working within the TV creative structure to doing it on your own? I love working within the TV structure. I've only I've had one documentary on Channel Four last year called Meet the Markles, where I went to America to meet Meghan Markle's family and try and get an invite to the wedding. Spoiler alert, I didn't go. Mm. But um, it was still a great opportunity for me. And, um, but yeah, working with production company Monkey Kingdom, like they were brilliant. I think, you know, it was my first time doing something on television and to have the backing of like a production company that was so collaborative uh, made things so much easier for me. And I had a, a brilliant time. Um, but yeah, and then, and then um, I don't know. I just feel like when you're, as a creator, when you're doing literally everything yourself, you, I produce them myself, I'm, I'm in it. Um, I have to do all the marketing, as you said, like that is amazing that you have creative control, but also it's like incredibly daunting, like everything is on you to do like the jobs mm. of so many different people within a broadcast mm. structure. So for me, when I get the opportunity to work with TV, like it is amazing because you get to collaborate. And of course you can collaborate as your own creator, but like, I don't know, there's something different about it. And I think in terms of like the back to the question of like if telly is an, a turn off for new talent, I feel like it's all about collaboration yeah. because for like digital talent to, I think, succeed on TV, it has to be a collaboration between the like skill set that the broadcasters know and the what the skills that digital talent can bring to. Um, and I think once you have that communication of like what works and what not, exactly what Asim was saying about the development of people just do nothing. Like if they'd have just, if BBC Three, which they never have done, just said, Pia, do it without any sort of character development or any of those We would have been cancelled a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have worked. So I think it's the same with any with anything, with any show, whether it's scripted or whether it's fact and I think you have to have that development stage. Um, lucky for me with Meet the Markles, you know, there was already the structure of a doc we want to do a documentary and it's channel four documentary and this is how it's going to be um but yeah so it was kind of using that template that was already there but then obviously having me as the kind of the the new talent involved yeah that would be my biggest note to, to indies um is that it is absolutely about collaboration the point of the talent is that the talent have a spirit or a voice that is what you are you know the, what the broadcaster wants so don't crush it and you're supposed to nurture it and, and amplify it and uh, um, appreciate the audience and the tone that they've already built because they've tested that and built that and created it and have you know ownership over that before this bigger thing comes along. Um, and that's where you can sort of sense that conversations could go wrong. Yeah, yeah I just think with, with but in the, the other side of it, I guess, is like for new talent coming and working with, with broadcasters, I think the biggest thing is like managing your expectations because as like people who are in control of their their own content, I think that you can you get very used to just if you want to do something, you can just do it. Whereas then you get you get the exciting email to go and like meet whatever controller and you're like, oh my god, I'm gonna get my show. And then you come in and then it's just like one of millions mm -hmm. of meetings. And then <laughs> and I just think like I think for me, like the biggest thing I would say to new talent is just like, yeah, manage your expectations <laughs> because it's not yeah. gonna happen <laughs> for a while. But that's just because the in the like the industry is mm. so different than than YouTube and it's just there's so many different people that have to sign something off. And I think that you can actually get quite you know, not frustrated, but you, you can just feel a bit down, I guess, sometimes when you don't think things aren't happening like that because you're so used to as a YouTuber just being like, it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um, TV likes to almost categorise itself. So we have like genre teams. Mm. Whereas if you're a YouTube creator, you see yourself as a creator. So, you know, some of the stuff that you do is very comedic. Some of it is you describe yourself a lot as an entertainment talent or would you say it's fact then? Where it, exactly, you, you sort of don't know or don't really care because you're creating great content that's connecting with an audience. So I think sometimes we have to look at ourselves in terms of we create these genre boxes which isn't conforming mm. to the other way around. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of there's a bit of uh, a gap bridging to be mm -hmm. done, which is effectively what you're doing over at Talentworks. And we'll talk about it uh, in a sec. But let's have a quick look at a reel that you've done.
Uh, so, so what are you doing over at Talentworks? How long have you been up and running for? So we launched in October last year, so yeah. fairly new. We're, it's, we're a label within BBC Studios. So our total focus is on, as Adrian said there, building bridges between BBC Studios, which houses some of the best production facilities in, in the UK, and new emerging green talent. So an example of something we did was we ran a comedy retreat earlier in this year where we partnered with the BBC Writers Room and we took eight digital creators away for four days and Amelia was one of them. And it was basically two objectives. One, build a relationship with BBC Studios. And secondly, sort of upskill, but not in a patronising way. It was sort of like breaking down the jargon that the TV industry imposes. So if they, Amelia was going to come in and then someone was saying, oh great, have you got a treatment for that? Have you got a character arc for that? What's the, what's the story of this? She, she doesn't have to write a treatment for what she's created. What she has got is an incredible voice. And it's sort of what you were saying, you know, you'd already cracked the, the characters in the world. You might have not cracked writing a great treatment or uh, your great pitch, but you've sort of got the bare bones. So that's what Talentworks does. It works to upskill and, but again, not in a patronizing way, to bring together and bridge gaps between new talent that are online. So we sort of like to call it digital talent, but you can sort of scrap the word digital. It's just talent that is on a different platform. We look for storytellers. So people that have great voices, whether that's comedy, factual, you name it, it's cross genre and cross platform. I mean, th these uh, retreats sort of away days, they sound like a fucking nightmare. <laughs> do, they, uh, do they work? Are they good? Oh, I don't know. Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're not nightmare. Okay. <laughs> no, I loved it. It was amazing. Like just as you said, like because I'm someone who would like, I like writing scripts at the moment, but I had no idea how to do that. And something as simple as like, yeah, exactly, like story arcs or how to like introduce a character into the first episode of, of a sitcom. Like they're all kind of things that we were learning there. Um, but yeah, it, w it was amazing. Even just to meet other writers, it was great because I never like get to interact with that many other people that are like on screen talent or or like other writers. So even just to meet those people is great. I think there's like, um, in this country we have like, you know, like I've pitched a few things, but it's always, I always pitch to the producer from the production company. In America, like we went out there a couple of years ago, we were pitching a few things. You kind of pitch directly to the networks. And you know, it's, a lot of it is about you being in the room and selling them the idea, selling them that dream. I think it would be nice to see that come over here because here there's always that middleman, you know, with the producer and the production company. It would be nice to go into a room with a commissioner and sell them, you know, kind of a bit like that partridge scene, mm. you know, <laughs> <laughs> smell my, you know, that, not that, but you know what I mean? It, it, I think, I think there's like, there is, there would be, there is some benefit in having that direct, for, for someone who can't, I'm not great at treatments, you know, I can write, but you know, I can write a script, but in terms of selling it and make it look all flashy and all that, I'm rubbish at that. I'll do something shit on Microsoft Paint, like it'll look shit. <laughs> but like, if I'm in a room, I could sell anything to anyone. <laughs> You know what I mean? But I think that's what it is. Like you have to have, they have to see that kind of energy, that charisma, you know, that passion. And I, I think that it would be nice to see more of that happening in, in our industry where people who, are, who might not be the most academic or articulate and can do this, can do that, but can go in a room and tell them that your passion and your dream. And then on the basis of that, you can start working, you know? I think that'd be nice to see. Yeah, here, bring but. people in. And we, a lot of people come in to see us and meeting them directly is definitely more exciting. Yeah. And more infectious and sticks in the memory more whenever you've met the... Yeah, because you know what it's like. You get treatments and yeah. scripts and they just sit on your table and it's like, you know, where's yeah. that passion? You want to bust in the door and yeah. go, listen, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my dream, motherfucker. You, know? <laughs> you want that energy, you know what I mean? And people like that. In America, it's like yeah, that. It's yeah. In America, it's like that. It's like, okay, what you got? You know, and you're like, uh, uh. <laughs> right, so. Uh. <laughs> the first time I did meetings in America, I genuinely, because they're so full on yeah. uh, and so into you, I came out and thought, I think I've got my own sitcom. Yeah. I didn't have my own sitcom, but you genuinely just like, well, they, they loved me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think there's a bit of work as well, Helen, to do with sort of, because it's about bringing digital creatives and TV people close together and TV people need to sort of shift a bit as well. Do you talk to them about how they can more effectively work yeah, with new talent? Absolutely. It's sort of meeting people halfway yeah. with mutual respect and coming coming at it feeling like absolutely 
telly has got a lot to give, but also the other party coming to you has got a lot to give. So the projects that you saw there, a lot of the time we've had um, talent in the edit suite with us, in the cutting room, mm. sort of being involved at every step of the way. If you say you want to be involved with a creator, they've got the authentic voice. So sort of you have to bring them in every step of the way and build a team that want to respect that and want to have the creator's voice involved every step of the way. It's good to say, because I guess that the real, um, the, the challenge is maintaining the sort of authenticity and not in some way kind of diluting or bastardizing what was good about the thing originally. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've got to get better at, isn't it? Yeah, I think it, what, what we want to work with is, is talent who want to do something broader than their platform. So they can create content on YouTube. Brilliant. Car carry on doing that. Come to TalentWorks or BBC Studios or, or a commissioner when you want to do something different or broader or slightly separated. Like you, like you said at the beginning, you know, people do, just do nothing. The TV show ended up being something sort of, it had that essence, but it, it was a bigger scale of production. That's sort of when you want to talk to talent. What are some of the challenges that you've found working with sort of TV execs, Nassim? Um, well, they're all, you know, Illuminati. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? No, I, th I think that, not in a bad way, but I think there's a certain kind of hierarchy in every channel production company. You have a few brilliant producers. You have kind of <laughs> a tyrant kind of overlord in a good way. You need <laughs> you need them. You know they're yeah. the ones who get shit Big done. Up the tyrant overlords are in. <laughs> no, they get shit done. You know what I mean? You need you need the head honcho, yeah. the person who's gonna you know the businessman <clears> who gets stuff done or businesswoman. And then you have brilliant producers. You have you know it's just a kind of a, a setup. And I find that you know working with different production companies, different channels, you have that. And I think the most important for me, the most important thing is if I want to work with, I don't care how big the production company is, I don't care the format. For me, it's about having a brilliant producer. Like producers are the heart of all kind of projects for me. Like, it, you know, I've, I've, I've left big production companies, you know, I've taken my projects off them because I didn't think the producer was up to, you know, they honestly, they are the heart and they run the show. You know, if you, and when you have like our producer, John Petrie, who's now at Channel 4, he's a commissioner there. You know, he was, you know, he bled people just nothing. Like it was his life. It was this, you know, it was this, every, he gave everything to that show, you know, and it, it's nothing to do with money, it's nothing to do with success, it's about pride, it's about something you've started and you want to make sure that it's brilliant, you know? And that's why when we won the BAFTA, it was kind of like a thing of like, yes, all that hard work, because, you know, we didn't chase ratings, we didn't try to broaden it out. We would still know that People Just Nothing isn't like an in-betweeners or a peep show, it's still quite, it's not mainstream, mainstream, but we, we were really happy, we, we're, we're comfortable with that. And I think, and yeah, and credit to John Petrie and Asha Tyler, I think they both understood that it could have been this really big, broad thing if we wanted it to be, but because we really thought, no, we want to make sure that we keep it true to its roots and what we started on YouTube. So I think it's, I think it's been interesting, but producers are everything. Like, yeah, if yeah, you find a good producer, and that's why I, you know, as I go on, I stick with the same people, really. I work with, the, you know, the, the, the director on People Just Nothing, Jack, um, the producer. I want to work with them again because they're brilliant. And I think you find that with artists in collaboration, you know, when you find something and it works, then, you know, stick with it if it's not broke. So, and it's yeah. really hard to find great producers. I honestly think it's a really, really brilliant talent if you're, you know, it's yeah, a great find. The producer's close to the, the creator and they yeah. keep the creator's confidence up that you're not going to fuck exactly. up with their idea and their spirit. So the, and the producer's with them on every shoot and every day. So mm -hmm. if you lose the confidence, of that person, that point person, you are a bit fucked. So I would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, 100%. How, how reliant on, on the work of, mm. for example, Talent Works are you at, at BBC Three? How much of that stuff do you do in house? Uh, we, we do some of that in house because our own in house team, um, you know, come forth as part of the development process every week with their own ideas. They know what areas we're looking at. So they're constantly saying, well, there's this person doing this. So we're going to start. Uh, piloting a show with Harry Pinheiro soon and that came up because of you know we were interested in looking at a certain area that he was going to be relevant for um, going back a couple of years and uh, like Ben Zand now works with BBC Studios and he uh, worked in the digital you know a couple of years ago in the digital space and now he does documentaries for BBC Three so it, that has been you know that is really important 
as a place for us to find people because then you can see so you can see their voice see what works see what they want to be rather than the tv people trying to think actually we think you could be a bit like this and you could speak like this and you could say it like this and you could you know and that just doesn't work I, th I think there's a I, I, basically i think sometimes like because we've kind of seen it from the early stages of youtube so we've know, we know a little bit about YouTube, we know more about TV, mm. kind of our journey. But what I've seen in the last few years is kind of, you know, TV, you know, executive and people, they kind of look at things and they think, oh, that's gone viral. Yeah, you know, we'll, have jump on it. we'll have yeah. a bit of that. We'll have a bit of that. And then, you know, it's kind of that rush of like, you know, that's selling fast, let's get that. You know, it's kind of this almost like wheeler dealer mentality where it's like, that's hot, let's get that, put that in there. And then sometimes they don't work, right? So I think and then sometimes you find something and it's like more of a slow burner mm -hmm. and you develop it. But then on the other side, for the kind of viral person, they kind of look at television and go, well, that's official. Like, yeah, my YouTube, I've got millions of things. But if I'm on TV, there's this, you know what I mean? So I think both there's a slight delusion there where the TV people are going, oh, yeah, they're viral. They're hot. You know, but yeah, they're hot for a month. Then the next viral thing comes along. And then for the viral person, it's like, I'm on Channel 4, mum. Like, you know. Yeah. But then you look at Channel 4 ratings and it's like, well, actually, you're getting more views on YouTube. So slide this there. No disrespect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Um, no, so I think there is a slight delusion there. And I think there needs to be an honesty on both parts. There needs to be a transparency where it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you've got 10 million hits in a month or whatever. But what have you got next? Can you develop that? What, are you going to sustain that? How, you know, what is your fan base like? Are they loyal? Are they, or do they just want that again? Do you know what I mean? So that there needs to be a conversation. I don't think there's a conversation there because people just go, yeah, let's do it, money, yeah. you know? What were you saying earlier about um, you can't recreate viral? Like you can't recreate something that's viral? Yeah, you can't. I think if you set yourself out as a thing of being like, oh, I'm going to make a viral video. Yeah. Like, are you setting me up for what I think you're setting me up no. for? No. <laughs> what? All right. So are my shorts really low? I feel like I keep on putting them. Are you getting a bit too much spine? Distracted. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were riding up Well, slightly, they were quite yeah, high, they were weren't they? <laughs> if I pop out, just let me know. Oh, yeah. well. um, no, but no, I think you, well, are you set me up for the T-shirt thing. No, but you can talk about the T-shirt. Talk about the T-shirt, yeah. Go on. All right, so you know, we're talking about you can't create something viral. So I was on holiday last week <laughs> and I twisted my ankle. I was in the hot tub, I was drunk. And um, <laughs> I twisted That's my amazing. ankle. So obviously I was out of action for a couple of days. So I was just like, I'm obsessed with that Come Dine With Me episode. You know that? Congratulations, Jane. You've won. <laughs> you know that episode, yeah? And um, I'm just obsessed with that. And I don't know why. And I was like, up late night and I was on Photoshop and I, Photoshop and I started making a T-shirt. And the T-shirt was like his face and them in the background with like a really classy font. And it said, enjoy the money, Jane. And I just put it on Twitter, like three in the morning. And I went, I'm bored. I made this. And then I woke up and it had like, you know, I don't know, like 1.5 million people had seen it on Twitter and it went viral. And then everyone was like, oh, where can we buy it? <laughs> so then I just called up my merch guys and then the next day it was for sale. And I was just, <laughs> but I was like, I couldn't have planned that. You yeah. know what I mean? That is something TV can't do. That is something TV can't do. But weirdly <laughs> enough, it's a TV reference. So, but yeah, I'm just saying it's, it's weird in it's that way. It's incredibly too bad G as well. It was, very, it was very meta. They were like, hold on, are you actually selling t-shirts in yeah. real life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm yeah. method. <laughs> method. <laughs> you can buy the t-shirts, by the way. <laughs> I'm not even joking. It's. Um, <laughs> The website is. No, uh, come on. What's the website? No, I think you can sell a bit. It's yeah. right um, right. This website is whatasadlittlelife.com. Because <laughs> <laughs> remember in the clip, he goes, Dear Lord, what a sad <laughs> little life, Jane. Anyway. And then Jane from the episode commented on my Instagram. That's I brilliant. swear to God, she was in my Instagram. She was like, no, this is how it happened, blah, blah, blah. So, and then, <laughs> but then we squashed the beef, and now I'm sending her a t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> That's the internet for you. <laughs> it's the Wild West. It's, it's the Wild West. Circle of life. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about do you, that. Do you think that um, digital platforms are, and we've kind of touched on this a bit, are being taken as seriously as they should, or is TV still, for some reason, seen as like the holy grail to, to both in the industry and the audience? Mm. I think it still is seen as kind of a level up mm. than um, than YouTube anyway. Um, even though, as we were all, everyone saying, like you can be getting this X yeah, amount numbers, of views, yeah. the numbers don't correlate. But still, I feel like it's people take it more seriously. Whether that's, I also think it's a lot to do with like kind of the way it's written about in terms of like the press that TV gets is mm. just like unmatched to probably that that like you, a YouTuber would get. 
um, it's just a completely different audience as well. Like somebody that's got like millions and millions of subs on, on YouTube, like could just walk part, walk in this room and maybe like no one would even know who they were. Like it, that is kind of mad. But I do feel like um, for me especially, like TV is something that I definitely is an ambition of mine, like to, to you know, be in that space more. And I don't know, I don't know why that is, because I guess I could just be doing it on my YouTube channel that has mm. this, is, this many followers, this many views. But I think it's more about reaching a different, a wider audience as well. Is there, is there also TV. like a like a togetherness about it? Like, you know, when something's on and the whole nation is watching, watching it, yeah, 9 p.m., okay. Love Island, like, or, you know, whatever, Big Brother, like, we're all tuned in to watch it. The and repeat that, come dine with me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also there's that thing of, oh, Ep1, yeah, that was amazing. I can't wait till next week. YouTube, bang, it's all there. N Netflix, bang, you know, just yeah. binge. Mm. There is that, it takes away, I think, a little bit. I remember when people just nothing, our first or two yeah. series on TV, and then obviously BBC Three mm. went online, and then they just started dropping the whole series online, but then they were repeating it on television, and then our figures were really low on TV because everyone had seen it online. So it, it does sometimes momentum, mm. you, know, you know? I think there yeah. is something. The interaction in the real world yeah. with the content is a lot different. When everyone's watching it at the same time. Look at yeah. Love Island, like me and you were tweeting yeah. during Love Island. That's like my favorite time to tweet. We were tweeting throughout the whole live tweeting, was that, you know? Yeah, live tweeting, And that's tweeting. great, like that is such an amazing, and that's why Love yeah. Island got all those numbers, because people were like, people who don't even watch it on Twitter, they're like, I can't fucking yeah. escape Love Island, or I'll just watch it. Whereas you know? YouTube or, or consuming online content, I guess, is a very like, is more of when an insular thing. It's yeah. like you do it at home in your own time. Um, like when no one's there, it sounds really silly, but yeah. <laughs> um, you, you just watch it when you want. And yeah, I guess what Asim was saying yeah. about TV being more of like a, you know, a goggle box type vibe it is that i'm on tv yeah. mom it's that thing yeah. and yeah. the marketing machine of tv is still quite powerful yeah. when it gets going it really yeah. is it like the bill billboards that. even like yeah. you get yeah. billboards for like like chicken chop bang there should um, be more <laughs> reviews and journalists reviewing youtube yeah. Yeah. and making you giving youtube that same level of all oh, right the new episode of chicken shop day is out what do you guys think? Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the perception of, I think of that's media right. yeah. is in terms of like how it's written about in the press. I agree. I think like I think there is a bit of a sort of sons of change at the moment, but certainly like three or four years ago, if you read an article with a YouTuber, it was either how much money do you earn or what the heck do you do? Yeah. Like that was yeah. almost the mainstream press top questions yeah. to ask. Mm. Not sort of what's your creative vision? How did you start this off? So it, it is sort of like meeting people with respect in terms of what creative content are you making? I think mainstream media is, is changing, but certainly three or four years ago, it was very much us and them. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think we might do a few questions from the audience. How do we feel about that? Anyone want to ask a question? I think we've probably got roving mics, but I can't really see, have we? Yes. Uh, any any <coughs> any questions from anyone? I mean, I can go off the app. Oh yeah, here, yes, uh, up there. I can just about see a hand. It's gonna. This should only take uh, forty-five seconds to get the mic to you. So everyone, talk amongst yourselves. Keep your hand over up. there. <laughs> Keep your hand up. Anyone closer got a question? That'd help me out. <laughs> yeah. Go on. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Start. The, start loud and then bring the mic in. Oh, it's here. Yep. Wonderful. Hi. Um, Make it worth the wait, please. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, in terms of um, YouTube content, I find that people are free to sort of experiment and play different personas, but in TV, people can sometimes get pigeonholed, and particularly with documentaries. So, for example, I'm Muslim. I see a lot of Muslim talent who only do Muslim documentaries. Um, do you think that's a problem and that's off-putting to people um, who are perhaps online and want to make that bridge? Uh, I think, you know, we endlessly have to be working on perceptions for sure. I don't think... Um, people should be put off, you know. Um, I, I find, like, I was just on the bus on Monday to, to Derry from Belfast, and, and people, somebody emailed me out of the blue with a story, and, I'd, and it was a good story. I knew, knew nothing about them. I don't know who they are. I don't know anything. And actually, it was just so powerful that they got me immediately, and I thought, actually, I could see a film in this, and got our team to say, you know, get, on, get them on the phone. So I don't think... I don't think people should be looking at TV and literally thinking, oh, they would never have me or that's the way they would use me. I think um, it is more more nuanced and it is, cha it is changing all the time. So I, I would be disappointed to hear people thought like that. And I'd like to think that if they thought like that, they could <coughs> tell us and we would 
you know, um, convince them otherwise, because we, we are doing that. that there is that time. argument of, um, like you were saying, the Muslim channel only does Muslim documentaries, yeah. right? I, I, I've always like, you know, like when, uh, you know, I, I think it's good for, to be proud of your identity and, you know, representation is a very important thing, which I still think is very severely lacking for British Asians. But I, I do find it a little bit divisive sometimes when, you know, they allocate you something and they go, well, this, here's the British Asian, there's nothing wrong with the British Asian network. I've got loads of friends who work there, but it's kind of like, well, we've given them that, you know, that's their thing. Let them do that. We could just get on, you know, crack on. So I think that's a problem. And I think, I don't think we need the, that segregation. I think it just needs to, we, and as young Asian people coming up, you know, like my little brother, he's 16, he kind of looks up in the industry and he only sees me, a few other people, Guz Khan, a few other, you know, Riz Ahmed. He only sees a, you know, a handful of people. And really that's ridiculous if you think about how much talent there is out there. And that's because sometimes, you know, we, you do just say that this is for you guys and you've got that now, you know, be happy with that. And I think that's wrong. And I think it's moving in the right direction. But I think YouTube helps that. I think YouTube is like, you know, you never look at YouTube and go, oh, well, that's that, that's that. It's just, it's, you know, it's whatever, mm -hmm. it's whoever. And I think television, like TV, needs to move more towards that yeah. setup. I'm going to um, take a couple from the app, actually. I don't usually like the app, but there's a good one here. Uh, it just says, uh, Asim, you've popped out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Pull them down low, pull them down low. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, the, also, also a question. Um, are YouTube and Instagram too saturated for newcomers to build an audience? Uh, not if your content's strong enough. I don't mm. think so. Like, there's people, new new creators ha coming up all the time. Um, like, just because, yeah, just because there's loads of content out there doesn't mean that yours isn't going to, like, pull through for whatever reason. Obviously, it might be a bit more difficult. But, yeah, I, I think that if you're doing something that's authentic to you, like everyone, ha just everyone has their own voice, obviously. And just by making something I think that's authentic to you and who you are, then you're going to be different from everyone else automatically. So I think, yeah, if your content's strong enough, then you shouldn't have an issue with the amount of other. YouTubers. Yeah, some of the people we get most obsessed with have just got a few thousand people or ten thousand people, which is a lot in in my head. Mm. Yeah. And it it does feel quite meritocratic as well. Like mm. basically, if your stuff is. Like, if you're looking at it thinking, well, the reason I'm not finding an audience is it's too crowded, mm. it might just be that you're crap. <laughs> yes. And, that, and that's yeah. fine. Like, that is fine. Like, not everyone has to be good. Yeah. True. Yeah, also, you could go, you go on, like, a wormhole. Like, when you start on um, YouTube, then you're just in one place, and automatically you're, like, some, somewhere, like, random, like, something about, like, I don't know. The dark YouTube journeys, yeah. I love them. They're them. And then you find, so, find a YouTuber that only has, you know, so many amount of subscribers, but YouTube allows you to, like, go and find the most random content. It's not my favourite way to just kill six hours. I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, great. Like yeah. You used Gone. to be the Sims, but now it's that. We spend hours on the Sims. Uh, any more in-room questions? Yes, at the front here. There's a mic very close to you. Here it comes. Hi. I was just wondering, Asim and Amelia, what advice do you have to TV channels, commissioners, um, who are all desperate to try and get more young viewers? Um, and also... What are your, I mean, Camila, you said you'd love to do more TV. What, how do you feel about the kind of Netflix and Amazon and the new s mm -hmm. versus the traditional broadcaster? Um, well, yeah, the, I guess, let's answer the second part of the question. Yeah, I think that all of those places, you know, Netflix will have me, I'll, I'll say, I'll just say yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any, any of those, I think, I think people um, are interested as much in those kind of online online streaming platforms as as broadcasters. I think it's just kind of whoever um, makes the best offer, I guess, in terms of a platform. Yeah, money and also, <laughs> not, not just money, <laughs> in terms of You've like- You've got your t-shirt money, mate, shut yeah, up. <laughs> whether it's, you know, um, yeah, a, a good option for you. But in terms of the first question, which was, how do you uh, what, advice, what advice, advice, what advice, what advice? The younger TV generation channels. to TV? Mm. I, I mean, I think personally, I think um, if it's not if it's not affecting culture and if it's not moving culture forward, there's no appeal for me personally. If I'm a young person, I'm thinking, okay, like basically, someone told me this stat the other day, like the highest grossing film of all time was Avatar. It's now, I think, taken over by. Um, uh, What's yeah, it? the end game. End game. So Avatar, up until six months ago, was the highest grossing film of all time, right? And if you think about Avatar, 
it's probably like the most, it's probably had the least impact on culture, pop culture. Like who even remembers that film? It was like, it made shit loads of money. So I think me coming up, I'm not gonna look and going, what makes money? That's successful, that's what I wanna do. I think it's important to understand what actually mm. shapes culture. And yeah. you know, the, the content in YouTube, that shapes culture now. That's part of our cultural narrative, it's part of our meme mm. culture, it's part of our, our sense of humor. The same way Peep Show and Inbetweeners and Alan Park, all that stuff was. So I think as a youngster, if I'm looking at television, I need to, I, they, so they, you almost need to go back and think, you know, when TV was making shows that were really shaping culture, I think, you know, I think that's, that's, that would be more attractive. Like, I think that's the way you get them to say, look, we, wanna, we don't want just a hit. We don't want a viral hit. We don't want to make, we don't want to do this. We want to make money, but you don't want to, you know, I think for me, it's about what are you actually contributing to the culture and does it move it forward? And that's what I would yeah. say to target. And I think also that young people are so like, are really in tune to whether something is like authentic or not. And I yeah. think that that is a really big thing. It's not, you, you could first, you could take like talent that young people really like and just put them on a show and be like, oh, they know this so-and-so, let's put them in a show and they'll love it. But I also think it's about making content that doesn't take itself too seriously because I think when something's too earnest, like well, for young people, I think it can throw them off. I feel like they, they want to see something which, you know, they can relate to in some way and they can think, oh, like, I, they, I don't know, they see themselves in it. So I feel like not being too... And not to be too patronising. Yeah, too patronising It's well. kind of like, oh, you like, you know, you like Big Shaq, look at this, you know. Yeah. Look at this. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, the, the old dad trying to listen to a bit of Drake. It's like, all right, mate. Like, you know, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, though? Yeah. It's like that kind of, like, you don't patronise. These kids are smart. My 16-year-old brother, like, Fucking hell, I was thick as pig shit when I was 16. <laughs> like the stuff he can do online and like, it's so, yeah. I mean, they are quite, a lot of the real world stuff they lack. Do you know what I mean? There is a, there is a, there is a, <laughs> but you know what I mean? They are pretty thick as well. But like in terms of like, you know, you know techno technology and all that, like they're so yeah. advanced. They're so, very advanced, it's gonna take over the world. Yeah, they are. Um, just before I, I let you all go, we're going to go down the line again, uh, and I just want you to each give me um, someone that you're watching online at the moment, um, that's creative, interesting, innovative, that you think the people in the room might not know about. Effectively, I'm asking you to do their jobs for them. Um, so, Fiona. Uh, Natasha Bateman on Instagram. What does she do? She, you have to tune in. She has a channel called Our Lady Balls. That's all I'll say. Oh. I'm in. <laughs> um, I watch a show um, called Gasworks. It's on Boiler Room. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, especially, poet. especially Al Han as well, and he does his own stuff too. I think that that's one to watch out for. I'd go Amelia Gething. She started on TikTok. You're going to say me yeah. then. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> also Amelia. <laughs> she started on TikTok and now does um, comedy, scripted comedy on YouTube. Okay. Um, mine's, uh, it's not a person, it's Tiny Desk. Um, it's quite popular. They do con live music in a, in a little library and it's just the best thing ever to listen to. The music is just incredible. And check out Asim Chowdhury and his t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> Available to purchase. Uh, that is all we've got time for. Uh, thanks very much to our fantastic panel, Asim Chowdhury, Helen O'Donnell, Amelia Zimoldenberg and Fiona Campbell. Um, I think the... Uh